Most years at the Spiel Game Convention in Essen, Germany, I get to spend some time with my friend Ken Shoda. Ken and I have very similar gaming tastes, so we spent a lot of time at the show giving one another feedback on what to check out, all the discoveries we might not have noticed regarding card games, Knizia games, and combinatorial strategy games, or as I like to think of them, the three Ks of the gaming world that we have in common. And I know they don't all start with K, but it's a K sound, so I roll with it anyway. For Ken, we find things that haven't gotten a lot of publicity because Knizia games will get talked about, but card games and abstract strategy games are often overlooked. Sometimes just because they don't seem that attractive, card games take terrible pictures when they're on the table for the most part. It's lots of empty space with cards floating around or it's just a hand of cards. It doesn't have that same appeal of a lot of big Euro games. And abstract strategy games, like the wood ones from Clemens Gerhards, they look pretty sharp on the table, but other ones, not so much, such as Paso, which I named as my game of Spiel Lesson 23. You can watch my overview here. It's a game by Clementa Musa and Stefan Mulhauser. It's a fantastic, simple design, but it's all cardboard components. You're not really gonna pay attention to it. It's all the gameplay that comes through, and that's what makes it engaging. It's not the graphics of it that catch your eye at first, so it's more about actually playing it and experiencing it and being like, oh, this is, really enticing. Another game that we found at Spiel Essen 23 is Oxano, or Oxano. Not exactly sure how to pronounce it, but we'll roll with Oxano. It's a game by Jeremy Partinico and Cosmo Ludo. And I'm talking about it now instead of earlier because the game will be released at the Festival International de Jeux the FIGA, FIJ Game Fair in Cannes, France at the end of February 2024. So why talk about it earlier if you can't experience it? Now it's coming to market, so you get to give it a try. Cosmo Ludo does uh, interesting game design where it looks very iconic. Everything they do has the same look to it. It's got this little magnetic flap, space for the components in the board. It has a paper backing so it'll come in shrink wrap and it's got explanation and multiple languages. It's got a rule book of multi languages. But once you buy it, you can throw this away and now you're left with this sort of 2001 A Space Odyssey slab. You can think of them. It's all the same format standing on the shelf. I had a little confusion about the name because I had it on my shelf, uh, as with all my games lying horizontal here. I look at Anoxo, but I was tricked because this is a European release and titles on European books are not written left to right from top to bottom, but left to right from bottom to top. It's supposed to be this way. Mmm. It works in both directions. The hazard of abstract names on abstract games. It's a thing. But let me get into how this plays because you probably won't care about the looks. You just want to know how it works. Here are the components of Oxano, with each player having 16 tokens, eight each with X and O, with totem showing X and O starting in the middle of the game board. Choose a starting player, they make a move, and you keep taking turns until one player reaches one of the two winning conditions and wins. There potentially could be a tie, but I haven't seen that in six games, although it could happen. I find it hard to believe, but it could. One winning condition is to get four of your tokens in a row either horizontally or vertically, or if you have four tokens of the same symbol in a row. So it can include the opponents. It's just on your turn, you're going to place one of your symbols. And if you reach either of the two conditions, you win. How you make a move on your turn, you move one of the totems as many spaces as you wish, horizontally or vertically. Then you place one of your tokens of the matching symbol adjacent to that totem. Again, everything horizontal, vertical in this game. So maybe the opponent goes, maybe I go. Look at me, I've got two O's in a row. I've got two black tokens in a row. Looks like I'm gonna win, right? So strange things can happen. You can have the opponent move over here and block it. So now I can't go up this way, but haha, I'm trying to be clever. I get three in a row this way. Well, they can just move up and now they have won the game. So 
Don't do that, Eric. Do something else. Often it's a little difficult to see sometimes once you set up these positions. Now I can't go here because again, the opponent can go here and win. So you have to start avoiding possible setups for the other player unless you're blocking it and then going to force them to move somewhere else that will let you come back and get victory. Very straightforward, very simple rules. Now, the one complication that you have here, well, okay, two complications. You can't jump over pieces. So if you're going to move this, it can go here, it can go here, it can go here, here. That's it. So let's say we go here and pink does this, is going to do something similar. Actually, it's my turn. There we go. Do this. We go here. And now you, let's say we go here. Possibly a terrible move, but I'll do it for purpose of explaining the game. This X token is now trapped and cannot move. So on the pink player's turn, they can move the O to any one of those four spaces, and that's it. And as we've discussed, placing an O here or here is a terrible move. Okay. Or they can move the X token by jumping to the first empty space. So they could do that. Okay, that's possibly not a great move. Maybe it is a great move, I'm not sure, but they can do that. And now they've done this, I might want to block it. And then maybe pink goes here for some reason. And now again, this can jump either to here, here, or here. But here, I would be forced to place an X. Here, place an X here or here. If I jump here, I can't place an X. And if you can't place a token adjacent to the totem that you just moved, you can place it anywhere on the board, in which case I would win the game. That's it for the rules. Move a totem, place one of your matching tokens adjacent to it, and then get four of your color in a row, or four of the same symbol. And there's an overview of Oxano, which, as I mentioned, I've played six times in a review copy from Cosmo Ludo. I probably pronounced it multiple different ways throughout this demonstration. You get to pronounce it whichever way you would like as well. As I mentioned, the rules are extremely straightforward. You know everything there is now about how to play. And I love abstract games for that simplicity, for the fact that the rule set is stripped down to its absolute minimum. There's nothing that you could remove without making it a different game. Everything there is fundamental and required. It's almost like how you form a mathematical system where you have the axioms of that system and then everything follows from there. You start with the axioms and you see what you can prove from those and you get the mathematical system. And if you have different axioms, you get a different system. And abstract strategy games sort of strike me the same way where they have these simple rules, usually extremely basic, where you move a piece, you capture a piece, you land on a piece, you got movement restrictions, whatever it is, and that's it. But the feel of the game derives from the different combinations of those initial axioms, the shape of the board, whatever the pieces are, it all comes out through the gameplay. So you read the rules and you're like, okay, I know how to play, but how do I play? And you discover that only from putting the game on the table and trying it, which I got to do a few times at Should Be Lesson 23 with Ken, because we head off we, we play one another as well and try to see who's better than who. All right, it's a little friendly competition, but it's also just the exploration of the game space itself as well. Now, I played additional times at home. I find it a fascinating game. Again, it's so simple. The rules don't detail any strategy or anything like that. It's all coming out of it out of the game as it plays, as you're observing it and seeing how the re opponent reacts to something and then how you respond to that. So it's this communication through these extremely simple starting rules and then everything flows from there. I like variability in games, 
but this is all variability coming through the gameplay. So we have something like Dominion, where it's got 25 different cards in the starting box, and then of course there's more than a dozen different expansion boxes available, and you have that variability as you swap elements in and out of the game, where you sort of have the rules the same, and then you have that adaptability or the variability that comes through from introducing different elements to play. Uh, I just recently played Imperium Horizons. It's a game, game box with 14 different factions, a two to four player game. I can't imagine playing with more than two. And each player gets a faction, so you've got an incredible number of combinations for what civilization will be facing off against another one. And that's aside from the rules itself. I find it hard to fathom how you can really review something like Imperium Horizons given the number of combinations available. Again, in a two-player game, you got 14 factions, so you got uh, 14 times 13 divided by two combinations. You're gonna play those, uh, what is it, 81 game, 91 games? You play 91 games and you get to try each combination of factions once? I guess then you switch sides as well, right? So I can play one against the other 13, but to get the real experience, I need to have be in control of those other 13 against the one. So okay, not 91, 182 different games to try each experience once. It's interesting, the idea, the variability available is interesting, but I don't think I'm playing it 182 times just to get that one-off experience of everything. It feels like there's more than I actually need in that box. The variability is a selling point, but am I actually going to get to it? Whereas then you have Oxano or Paso, and you get into the games incredibly quickly. You get to have that iteration of play. Often the games are extremely short as well. Imperium Horizons was roughly two hours for that first game. This is 10 to 15 minutes, sometimes five if you play poorly. It can be very short, but then you start again immediately, and then you play off of what you did before, and you try to play somewhat differently or build on that knowledge right away. It really gives you something to build up to over time. Again, thinking of axioms in the mathematical system. A background math guy. That's what I got my degree in, and that's sort of how I think about this as well, starting with these fundamental elements and then going on from there. So it's a fascinating game. I love the simplicity of it. I love the way it develops over time, and you start to see just dangerous positions for what you need to avoid or what you try to set up to try to get the opponent to fall into a certain position where you can have, uh, as in other abstract strategy games, you have sort of the timing of everything, where if you have a totem that gets enclosed, then you know how many moves it could take before it gets blocked completely. Sometimes it's variable, sometimes it's not. And so you can play off of that to try to force a situation of when that totem will get trapped and come out. Especially if the opponent has done lots of moves with the totem that's free, they're going to run out of pieces. And if you run out of an X, you have no more X tokens, you can't move the X totem. You must move the O. And you keep going from there. So there's a little timing element of the resources available. And it feels very natural as, you, as it comes out of gameplay. The tied situation is where everyone has played all of their pieces, everything's on the board, and no one has won. I find that super hard to believe because a lot of the gameplay seems to be building up towards the situation where you can have a totem that's trapped and then you can jump freely and go anywhere you want. Because if you can make that happen, you're almost definitely going to win because there'll be some situation on the board where you can lay down the piece and win. Seems like it. Again, I've only played six times, so limited amount of experience. Has, you know, the six by six board, it's enough to give you variety, at least so far, without being overwhelming. So it's not too restrictive, right? It's the Goldilocks just right principle. Similar to uh, Donuts, it's a Bruno Cathala game and initially available online as Insert 
where it's sort of a reverse Othello style play where if you have opposing pieces and you place one in between them, you flip them to your side. It's like you infect them and then convert them over to your side. You have restrictions in that game where there's a line on each space that tells you the direction that the next player has to play. So if I go here and the line's this way, you play somewhere on this line. So it has these movement restrictions similar to Oxano where you're putting pieces down on the board and directing where the opponent can move. So you have a bit of a look ahead. I know they can go one of these spaces and then if they go there, then I will have these options available to me and so on and so on. So you got a little follow through that way, but not an overwhelming amount. It's very cool. Love it a lot. There you go. You give it a try. Uh, you're curious about another one? I got Panterai from Cosmo Ludo. You can look at that as well. It's another review that I did in 2021. Love it.